So Galatians part 2, Galatians 1 and verse 14. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. Now, we had talked about that before and showed that some of these traditions and what they were, and, and to a large degree, how uh, detrimental it actually could be to follow some of them. Because there were some of these traditions of the fathers that were okay, there were some that were useless and somewhat benign, but there were some that were definitely against the commandments of God. And that's when you started getting into some really serious problems. So there were all these extra rules and regulations that were added by Jewish leaders, and this preceded Paul's time. But nonetheless, Paul was one of them that learned about these rules and regulations. And he wielded it with a heavy hand against the church to the point that he persecuted and even killed some of the members. And it was because they did not fall in line with these traditions and the way that Paul had come to understand the necessity of the law of God. So this was the danger of this extra knowledge that was coming into the camp that Paul was uh, to a certain degree uniquely qualified to address because here he is having you know had this quote-unquote extra knowledge that they had come to these extra rules and regulations that the scribes and Pharisees had added beyond scripture and he saw you know the detriment that it could cause in an area and especially to the people of God and this is what Paul is battling here in Galatians. Now, as I mentioned before, he also was dealing with this over in Colossae. Let's look at Colossians 2 and verse 8. And of course, keep your finger here in Galatians. We'll be coming back and forth. But Colossians 2, just a couple books over, in verse 8, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, I'm not sure if it was the same people, but you know, Colossae was not too far, if you recall, from where uh, the region of Galatia was, kind of south and west, there in western Turkey. But nonetheless, here we have the warning going to the Colossians as well about these philosophies. Now, philosophy basically is a way of life that every somebody else comes to outside of the law of God, outside of the way of God. Now, this happens all the time in the world around us, and this is nothing new. As people say, well, this is the way that I see life. Well, again, everybody in this day and age is entitled to their own opinion, even if it's wrong. But what Paul is saying is that you have to stick to the trunk of the tree. You have to stick to the word of God. And there is no reason, because it is sufficient unto salvation, for you to go somewhere else and to get more knowledge. There is no need for that. And yet these people were coming in, in Colossae, Colossae as well as this region of Galatia, and they were bringing in this extra, quote unquote, knowledge that they, that they were saying was necessary for salvation and for justification, as we've talked about and we'll see again. Now, Paul continues elaborating in verse 15 on his, conver his conversion at the hand of God. All right? he makes, he's making these points because he's showing at the same time that all these things come from God and not from man or from these Gnostic uh, ideas, this Gnosticism that was creeping into the church here and there. Verse 15, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Now, Paul is revealing to us here that God can call from the womb, and he does call from that point. He set them aside for a purpose. He set Paul aside for a purpose, and he sets those that he will call in their time, because Paul wasn't called until around say 35 AD. Up until that point though, he had been set apart, set aside to be called at that time. Now he expounds on that a little bit more in Romans 
8. Let's turn over there, Romans 8, 28 to 31. And of course, we also know that you know Jeremiah, a prophet, was set aside at that point, and that um, you know there are there's other evidence of this throughout the Bible. But here it is that Paul in eight Romans eight verse twenty eight talks about it a little more in depth. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. All right, so God has a plan that was, has been in motion since before the foundation of the world. And a part of that plan is for those that he's going to call. He sets them aside. He knows that he's going to call you at a certain time. He, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. All right, so he predestined and he called, and whom he called, these he also justified. Again, the, one of the main themes of the book of Galatians that we're talking about. And of course he dealt with it uh, considerably in Romans as well. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? So once God sets this chain of events in motion, he is going to be sure to fulfill it and to carry out this purpose. And also notice back in Galatians that this calling comes through grace. The calling that we receive, that Paul received, is a gift of God. It comes because of God's undeserved favor and love that he shows towards us. It's a gift. It's not from man. Again, He's trying to make this point thoroughly and throughout, especially the first chapter, to show that, again, that the things that he's saying and the commission that he's been given and the office that he has, all these things come from God. The knowledge that the Galatians was receiving were, in terms of this Gnosticism was of man, the traditions of man, the temporary laws, whatever it was that they were saying that the Galatians had to keep and had to do to be saved was of their own doing, not of God. The calling, again, back to the grace that is given, that comes from God and it's a gift and it's not anything that we can do or earn or that we even deserve. It's not like we did something and said, oh, there's somebody good, I'm going to call them because look at what they've been doing. Nope, it is a gift from God and has nothing to do with what we did and who and what we are at that point. Now why he was called? Galatians 1 verses 16 through 18. It was to reveal his son in me by and through the power of the Holy Spirit of course that I might preach him <clears throat> Christ among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood so he's saying, <clears throat> I didn't immediately do it. I, of course, talked with these guys later down the road, but I want you to understand that my uh, insight here that comes from God, from Christ in me, the revelation, did not come from men. It came from Christ. And I didn't go up to Jerusalem, verse 17, to those who were the apostles before me, before I was an apostle, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. So <clears throat> we're told here that he was actually taught by Christ in Arabia. Now, whether it was physically, you know, where, you know, Christ physically taught him, was there and taught him, or whether it was by revelation through the Holy Spirit, as he mentioned uh, previously in verse 12, we don't know for sure. God was working with him, though, in a special way to reveal these things to us, to him, and perhaps in the same way that he reveals it to us. Any of the things that we come to today typically is because of God's Holy Spirit working within us, that power of God, the means by which he reveals spiritual knowledge to us. It could very well have been the same exact way, maybe, and perhaps on a greater level, a more intimate level, uh, you know, that Paul needed to reveal what it was 
that Paul needed to understand. Paul understood the words of the Bible. I mean, he let me say, let me rephrase that. He knew the words of the Bible. He didn't understand the words of the Bible was his problem until he was called and converted on the road to Damascus initially. And then he had God's Holy Spirit working in and with him. So he's also bringing up the point that his credentials as an apostle are just as good as the other apostles. Again, he's not doing these things to brag, but to continue to make the point that the, the knowledge that he gave to them was accurate and sufficient. And they did not need to have any more knowledge from any of these other people who were, had a, you know, a boat to, to row or some bill of goods that they were trying to sell them. So he's establishing the fact for those in the region of Galatia that what he taught was legitimate. There was no need for any special knowledge for salvation. Now verse 19, Now I saw, but I saw none of the apostles, the other apostles, except James, the Lord's brother. So he did see James. But it's interesting too that, you know, I think there are some people who say, well, you can't have any other apostles except the original 12. But here we have James, we have Paul, he's saying that he was an apostle, he's called an apostle. Uh, Barnabas, there's others. So I think we can you know, rule that out and safely say that the 12 apostles weren't the only apostles that there were going to ever be. And that there were indeed others who were sent forth, as we said, with a message. They had a mission, a, a word that they were supposed to get out, as it were. Verse 20, now concerning the things which I write to you, Indeed, before God, I do not lie. So he's kind of wrapping up this section by stating in no uncertain terms that the foundation that he laid, you know, that he began in this letter, you know, this chapter one, is the truth. He, he wants to be clear that he is not you know, vacillating in any way that what he's telling him is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, verses 21 through 24, it says, Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, which we showed on the map last time, right? Towards the, the uh, border of Syria and Turkey on the Mediterranean there. And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. They, you know, didn't recognize him in any way, but they knew him by reputation, as we see in verse 23. They were, but they were hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. So he's saying the glory goes to God in all of this, of course, and that he was able, God was able to accomplish this change in Paul to bring him through conversion to the point where Paul would go from being one way to another. That is for now, not only being a, a believer, but teaching and preaching all the tenets of the faith to others. Now, chapter two, and again, you know, chapter breaks were put in after the fact. I mean, whenever we write a letter, we don't necessarily put it in chapters and put in verses and things, but because of the fact that we need to go back and forth and all be on the same page, you know, we, we put the chapters and verses. But the, they did try to put the chapters in when it was, you know, say a paragraph break or when there was a change in the, the thought. And that is the case here. We kind of switch modes. So Galatians 2 and verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus, who was Greek, with me. So they're going up to the conference at Jerusalem that you can find in, in Acts 15. And it was the one regarding the circumcision. Now, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and he had full recognition of them. Now, Titus, though, was a Gentile, and it was decided at the conference that there was no need to circumcise him, Titus being this, this Greek, this Gentile, or any of the other Gentiles, for that matter of fact, because circumcision was not an issue of salvation. Circumcision, this physical act, had nothing to do in that respect with earning salvation. Yet, of course, this is what the Jews had come to believe. Because 
it began in the Old Testament that you could not become a part of Israel, physical nation of Israel, to keep the Passover, in other words, with them, unless you were circumcised. And the Jews, being the Jews and the, the Pharisees and the way that they were, again, carried this out to the nth degree. Verse 2. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Of course, the same gospel. But privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. So he was respected as the apostle to the Gentiles. And this running in vain was, again, this is in a present tense. So it's something that he was continuing to do. He had not completed it. He hadn't just completely finished running he continued to do the work and we know Paul used many uh, I guess athletic metaphors in a lot of his speaking now verse 3 yet not even Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised right for the reasons that we've already said and again this is at this conference where you have the other apostles there and of course James the apostle at Jerusalem as well and this had become a point of contention it was a point of division in the church because Paul had begun this gospel as he was commissioned to go to the Gentiles and he's preaching to them salvation and yet here are the Jews who are still acting in this kind of segregated manner and saying well they're not like us we're a little better than them because we're circumcised among other reasons and yet the conclusion of the conference was that he, okay yeah Titus did not have to be compelled to be circumcised and he came back still uncircumcised and still a Christian in verse 4 and this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage now these false brethren we'll find out were the Pharisees and again they were not true brethren right they were not really among them but they brought in these false doctrines these false ways and so Paul begins to you know make the parallels here and to show that okay this is what happens they this is why these things happen because they came in and they were saying things that were not true things that they were again bringing everybody to believe were true and everybody's getting all upset and of course now Paul has to take care of it so by the reality though of what they did they're bringing in this quote-unquote knowledge and saying these things they were actually taking the liberty of Christ away from the Christians, away from the church of God. Now, liberty here, we see they came as by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. This liberty is this freedom, right? Liberty is this, we have this opportunity, once you know God's way, to act as we should. All right, not as we please. All right, so we have a liberty, right? We have this freedom to act in the way that God says to act. Okay, and we know that we're not to act in the carnal way, this way that the inner man, this uh, man that we're carnal man that we're trying to leave behind, wants to act. So we are being liberated from sin in that respect. And it was these false brethren coming in that was taking away that liberty and leading the people back into sin. Let's turn over to James 1 and verse 25. And we see that the law, this perfect law of God, is indeed a law of freedom. It's one that makes us free. It sets us free mm -hmm unlike the way that the carnal man sees the law. The carnal man sees the law as putting you in bondage. And in reality, it's false doctrine that puts you in bondage. It's false philosophies that we're talking about. These ways that man conjures up in the traditions that man brings to the table. 
James 1 and 25, he says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, lives by the word of God, the law of God, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one would be blessed in what he does. So again, he's saying it is a law of liberty. It's not burdensome. And it's something that we're to continue to be mindful of and to not forget and to continue to do. Then chapter 2 and verse 10. What is this law of liberty that he's talking about? For whoever shall keep the whole law and st yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. And what law is this? For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. The law that he's talking about here is the Ten Commandments. He's saying it's not done away with. And what is that? The Ten Commandments, verse 12. So speak and so do is those who we judge by the law of liberty. Again, we look at the Ten Commandments as being the foundation on which basically all the other commandments come from. This is a law of love. It's love towards God and love towards your neighbor, as Matthew talks about. And so here he's saying that this law is a law of liberty and freedom. It is not a law of bondage. It is not a law that binds you up and says, oh, my life is now so restricted now that I can't go out and kill people or murder them. No, that's not what he's saying. It's the exact opposite. You know, now you're free to live you know, apart from the consequences of breaking this law of liberty. So by keeping the law, we are liberated from sin and its penalty, which is death. That's the penalty of sin. So in God's way, there is definitely a true liberty and that he's showing you a way that does not lead to death. But he's also saying here, and James is saying, of course, Paul says throughout, that there is still a need to keep and obey the law. Let's turn over to 2 Peter verses 18 through 20. Peter is expounding a little more on what we're saying. 2 Peter 2, verses 18 through 20. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, you know, who are we talking about? Yeah, we're talking about these vain philosophers. They allure through the lust of the flesh. That he's talking about the means by which they actually accomplish these things and what they appeal to in you know us as humans. Through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Now, while they promised them liberty, they're saying that that's what they actually bring. And this is what was happening in, in Galatia, right? They came in and said, oh, we've got the special knowledge. Okay, you know, the, we got the secret handshake, as it were, that allows you into the kingdom. It is by this specific knowledge that you don't have, that Paul did not give to you, that he didn't explain fully, that we, we've got the answer. All right? And this will set you free. This will get you everything you want. This will get you the liberty. They're selling them of this bill of goods. Well, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are, are slaves of corruption. They're carnal, sold to sin. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also is he brought into bondage. So because these men were not preaching true liberty and preaching the word of God accurately and being actually in bondage to that liberty as it were they were in bondage to sin they were slaves to sin themselves for if after they escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ they are again entangled in them and overcome the latter end is worse for them than the beginning so to go back to that which we left behind to the carnal man after having received the knowledge of God and the promises 
of it and the liberty that comes with it, if we go back, there remains no more sacrifice for us. There, God is not going to come back and sacrifice himself again because we turned our back on him after we've been given that opportunity. No, we go back into bondage. So those that were telling the Galatians that they needed to be circumcised or they needed to keep these temporary rituals or that they needed to follow the traditions of men you know, that they had come up with themselves to obtain all these things that they had to do to obtain justification or to be right in the sight of God were actually leading them back into bondage and out and away from liberty. Acts 15 Acts 15, and you can put 1 through 11 in your notes. This is the conference we were talking about. Notice what, you know, what was happening, what was going on, and what the conclusion was. It said certain men came down from Judea, Judea and taught the brethren, said, unless you are circumcised, According to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, you know, they're arguing with them, obviously telling them just the opposite, that they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go up with them to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia, Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren, continued to preach the gospel along the way. And when they come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all the things that God had done with them, saying, see, look, God's working with these people. He's calling them to salvation. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Again, we're talking about these ritualistic temporary laws. Now, the apostles and the elders came to consider the matter. So here's the conference kind of beginning. And there was much dispute. Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And that's when he went to Cornelius. And so God, verse 8, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. So God gave the Gentiles the Holy Spirit. There was no denying it. And he made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, not by works. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples? Why do you put them in bondage? Why are you taking them from this law of liberty? Why are you adding these extra things? on the disciples which neither our fathers were able to bear. We couldn't even do these things. We still don't do these things as Jews. And yet you want them to do them? Especially when it's not necessary? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So it was not about circumcision. And so it was dispelled there in Jerusalem at that time that these things were not necessary for salvation. It was not necessary for the Gentiles to do these things. And yet here we have Galatia and these guys are coming in again and they're telling them the same story. Maybe changing a few of the you know, facts here and there as it suits them. But nonetheless, you know, whatever's gaining ground, gaining traction, they keep using and the Galatians are falling for it. Now back to Galatians 2 and verse 5. To whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue to you. Again, he was referring back to, to verse 4 and the, the false brethren who came in secretly to spy out their liberty. He didn't even give in to them at all. But from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, 
It makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. So again, you know, it reemphasizes the point that again Peter makes and Paul makes in other places that God is not a respecter of persons. All right? He looks in the heart, he doesn't look on the titles, he doesn't look how smart everybody is, because by comparison they aren't. He said, God's not a respecter of persons. He's not going to show favoritism. And then he says that the apostles added nothing to his understanding. So Paul, when he went into there, Paul was the one who understood these things, especially having to deal with it in, um, in these regions, these Gentile regions, whether it was Galatia or whatnot. And Paul, I think, because it was top of mind, was, had thought these things through and God had revealed them to him through his spirit as to what the the real heart of the matter was. And so when he went to Jerusalem in Acts 15, he saw the situation clearly as well and made sure that they came to the right conclusion because as we'll see later, he was not going to be, uh, as it were, withstood by any man. He was not going to let, who, didn't matter who they were, because Paul was not a respecter of persons either, come up and say something that they weren't supposed to say or do something in front of him, especially if it was a bad example to everyone else, that they shouldn't have been doing. Now verse 7, Galatians 2, But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, so Peter was the, the primary apostle, as it were, to the house of Israel, which mostly Jewish except for the scattered uh, people, um, he uh, Peter was to them and he was recognized even by Peter that it was Paul's commission to go to the Gentiles and we'll see that others uh, understood this as well now verse 8 Galatians 2 verse 8 for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised to the house of Israel also worked effectively in me Toward the Gentiles, and will when James and Cephas, who which who was Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. So the Gentiles, the other nations, that Gentiles are the people who were not the Israelites or the Jews who were the main uh, tribe at the time. That was, you know, to Paul, the, the Gentile nations. Verse 10, they desired only that we should remember the poor, the thing, the very thing which I was eager to do. So the only thing that they said was, okay, just remember the poor. And he says, you know, definitely that's, High on my list, that's what I always do and will continue to do. Verse 11, Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, this is one in Syria, a Gentile area, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. He was at fault after all of this. For before certain men came in, before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. So there was a time that yeah, that was not a problem. But when James and these men from James came in, they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. So the situation was that here he was, you know, he's, he's fine to eat with them. And again, we're talking about all these extra little, uh, what shall we say, uh, reasons for separation. You know, the Jews continue to believe in... The, the need for all these ritualistic washings and for circumcision and for eating separately from the unwashed, the uncircumcised, etc. All these things that were not biblical or were Old Testament temporary ritualistic laws, they were, again, continuing to see this need to say, okay, this is what makes us righteous and this is what sets us apart. 
and they couldn't have been further uh, from the truth. And the rest, verse 13, of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. So those who had were happy to sit with the Gentiles at one time, now were not. So that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. So they're all caught up in this kind of, um, what would you call it, riot mentality, this, this flock or sheep mentality, where you just move with the group. All right? they're, they're right here and they're sitting with the Gentiles and they go, oh, oh, there's some Jews in town. You know, let's go over here and we're going to sit over here. We're not going to sit with the Gentiles. And it was hypocritical for them to do it. And it was against the law of God to do this. And they should have known better by now. But when I saw, verse 14, that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles, not as the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews? So by his actions, he was showing that there was still a separation between the Jews and the Gentiles that there shouldn't have been. And he called him on the carpet for it in front of them all. Now, it's not exactly clear who them all are, whether that's just all those that he's now listed in you know the previous verses, you know, the the ministry or the apostles, or if it was in front of everybody, those that he was sitting with and not sitting with, I don't know for sure. I can see Paul of doing that because typically, you know, you have to handle some of these situations in the situation that it happened. But either way, he's, you know, withstanding Peter to his face in front of others. So definitely not a, a pleasant situation for Peter, but one of his on making for sure. Now verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, it was the, the Jews that had been given God's law. It was a gift to them. They understood what they were supposed to do, not that they always did it. Whereas the Gentiles did not. The Gentiles went and did whatever they want. They did not have the law of God, but God had given it to the Jews. And verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law. So here we are. This is, I would have to say, the pivotal scripture of the book of Galatians and what he is getting at. And this verse right here basically sums it all up and where he's going. So let me just read that again. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in and of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So here we come, as we said before, the theme, or the central theme of the book. This is the point that he's making. This is the point that he wants to make clear. Because others were coming in and saying, basically, that you were justified before God by these other things. He says, these other acts that you were uh, observing and doing and requiring Gentiles to do that they did not have to do did not bring about justification. That only comes by faith and not by works of the law. So I don't know that it can be any more clear than that in terms of how justification comes about. But the problem with this scripture, as well as with other scriptures in Galatians, is that what we said before last time is that it's not a matter of law or grace, and that's the way people view Galatians, that it's law or grace that Paul is coming to the conclusion about, but it's law and grace. Right? So here we have in this verse the works of the law. Now in the Greek it basically says 
ergon nomos, okay? It doesn't say the works, and it does not say the law. So those definite articles of the are left out. It is works of law when we talk about the, uh, the actual literal translation. Well, what difference does that make then? Well, because it's not talking to, about a specific work or a specific law that they're not justified by. Okay? It's not having to say, it's not talking about the ritualistic law. It's not talking about the Ten Commandments. It's not talking about the law of Moses. It's not talking about the sacrificial system. It's talking about any law and any works. All right? Now, by the same token, it's, not, it's also not talking about whether we need to keep the law or not. So we want to be clear. We're going to be clear on a few things here, right? Man is not justified by works of law, okay? You put whatever works you want to put in there, and you can put whatever law you want to put in there because it is nothing that we do in accordance with any other law that makes us justified, okay? So what is justification then? All right, so justification and righteousness are basically the same word. Except the problem that we have in our language today is that we don't really have a word that says, okay, yeah, I want you to be made right. Or I want you to be declared right. I want you to tell me one word that says that. Well, that word is justification in our language today. But if we were to say something like, uh, yeah, he was rightened or righteousness or something, or he was righted, perhaps, those words would convey to a certain degree what that means in terms of justify or to be made right. Justification is to be made righteous in the eyes of God. Okay, There is, okay, let's go back to what we're saying, there is no way and by no means, I want to be very clear about this from this time forward and this time back <coughs> and all the time, is that we are not saved by works of law. There's nothing that we can do to earn salvation. There is nothing that we can do to become justified. It is by faith in Christ that this mechanism comes about. So a person is justified by faith in Christ, not by anything that they do. So justification is, you know, if, if we've not been living the right way, and again, this does happen to all of us, and we sin, God begins by making us right through the forgiveness of our sins. We cannot earn forgiveness. We cannot do anything now to pay for something that we have done in the past that has earned us the death penalty. But justification, this being made right before God, brings us back into a right relationship with God, and it is by His grace, by His unmerited pardon, by His loving favor that He shows to us. Now, let's understand this also, that the only way that we can begin, okay, the only way that we can begin to keep the law and walk in this way of life is by faith and Christ in us. That is Christ working in us and is not by what we are doing. So, of course, we're not justified by the law, but that is not the function of the law, all right? And this is the problem here. These guys came into Galatia and were saying, well, here's what you need to do to be right before God. So whether it was circumcision or anything else, you're not made right before God by doing this. So when you look at it from that point of view and when you understand it from that point of view, then you can see exactly how silly it is and how you know empowered Paul would have been when he went to Jerusalem or when he would have dealt with these problems with these guys bringing in these heresies, that this is a no-brainer. That does not justify you. That does not forgive you. That does not earn you salvation. 
Now, what is the purpose of the law, though? The purpose of the law is to show us what sin is in order that we may avoid it and live a godly life. And we live that godly life by knowing what's right and wrong. And it is the faith in Christ that helps us, that shows us these things. Romans 3 and verse 20. So, again, what we're, the point we're making here is right now is that justification was one thing, the law is another. All right? Don't confuse the two, that the law can accomplish these things like the Galatians were being fooled. And today, the same is true. Romans 3 and verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds, okay, this is works, it's the same exact word, ergon, of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Okay, very consistent. And again, we're going to go to Romans a few times because we've already covered Romans. And if there's one thing that's obvious about Romans is that the law is not done away with, right? It says, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Why? Why, why, don't, why doesn't the work do that? Well, that's not the purpose. The function of the law is the knowledge of sin. The law of God shows us what's right and wrong. And the breaking of that brings about sin. Remember Romans 4.15, where there is no law, there is no transgression. But there is law, so there is sin. So there has to be law with sin. And then skipping down to verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Again, I think this is only two places, at least in my version, where it says deeds of law. And again, the word is works or ergon. So it's the same exact thing that we're talking about. So we can conclude, man is justified by faith apart from works. Now, the interesting thing here of note is that Luther inserted the word alone right after basically after faith. He says, we conclude that a man is justified by faith alone, apart from works. So he wanted to divorce these things. He wanted to make it law or grace. And of course, then throw away the law. You don't have to do that. You don't have to keep that because it doesn't earn you justification. Well, that was never again the purpose of it. Because of this one thought that he had, the whole Protestant Reformation began the Catholic Counter-Reformation began. Luther was ostracized or excommunicated. And this was, when was it, 16th century? Then the problems began to snowball from that point forward all the way to today where this controversy, as it were, continues to reign. Right? Now, the problem was is that James had something to say about it. And Luther really did not like that. James 2, verse 14. Luther called James the epistle of straw, which was supposed to be a derogatory term towards James, meaning it was, oh, this was not really that substantial or that meaty of a message or epistle. And some people actually even think that, you know, James may have been trying to correct Paul or Paul might have been trying to correct James through the book of Romans or James through, you know, Romans through the book of James. But neither is true because they both go hand in hand together and it's a, a misconception of why um, you know these things are said and why other things again you can't always explain everything every time but again throughout the Bible we put it all together so James 2 verses 14 through 26 What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? You know, I'm sure Luther's skin is already crawling by now. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, now he's giving us a, a, like an example or analogy, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what profit does it? And what good is your Christianity if that was all there was to it? These superfluous words. <clears throat> Thus, verse 17, also by faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. 
So he's going through and just basically dismantling Luther's argument, you know, 1600 years before, uh, you know, before time. And it's why Luther so despised this, this epistle. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. That's the way it really should be. You believe that there is one God. Again, you believe, right? This word for believe, whenever you see believe and faith, they're the same words. And again, we get the same kind of problems like between justification and righteousness or justifying being righteous. Believe is not kind of your own opinion. Right, so, well, my belief is that the world is flat. Well, you're going, well, that makes it sound like, well, that's your opinion, and it's not necessarily based on fact. The belief that we're talking about here is the same as faith, right? The faith that we have to have that there is a God, that God created the world, that Christ came and he was the Son of God and he sacrificed himself, and, you know, the faith in all of this. This is the same thing when you say, you believe there is one God. So you have faith. You definitely know that there is one God. Well, you do well. All right? Your faith is uh, founded. Even the demons believe. The demons have faith that there is a God. They know there is a God. There is nobody that knows better that there is a God in this world than the demons. Right? The demons were created by him, not as demons, but as spirit world, and then they went astray. The demons believe that there is a God. You know, there's a lot of people in the world who say there's no God. But what's the point he's making? He said they believe, they have faith that there's a God, they know there's a God, but they don't have the works that go hand in hand with that belief. He's showing belief is not enough. You cannot just have this dead faith, as it were. But you know, but do you want to know, O oh foolish man, Luther, that faith without works is dead? So again, it's, it's a systematic dis, disassembling of Luther's arguments before Luther was ever around. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he offered Isaac his son on the altar, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. It was imputed to him for righteousness sake. He was justified, in other words. He's quoting the same scripture that Paul quotes in Romans. So these guys were on the same page. They're talking about the same thing. Verse 24. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Not by faith alone. This is the only place where that appears. As much as you know, Luther wanted it to appear over there in Romans 3 in verse 28. This is the only place where faith alone appears in some versions appears, or faith only in the New King James. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. It is by works that we have a living, useful faith, not a dead one. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as, a spot, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So faith is this belief, this confidence and trust in what God says. So we do what he says then, right? I mean, it, you have faith in God and what he says? Well, what does God say to do? That's what you have to do then. You believe that he is God. You believe that he is all-knowing, all-powerful. You have faith. Then keep the Sabbath. God says keep the Sabbath. Keep the holy days. God says keep the holy days. What else does God say to do? What does God say not to do? Well, those things you do because you have faith. Those are the works that accompany your faith. 
they're inseparable. How can they not be together when you look at it that way? So when we have faith, we have faith in God's law, this law of love, this law of liberty that he has given to us. Faith is really this instigator to be obedient. Hebrews 11, verse 6 through 8. Hebrews 11, verses 6 through 8. Of course, Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. It goes through and it lists these great women and men of faith. You know, the, the examples of faith, these pillars of faith throughout the Bible. But notice what accompany their faith. So, without faith, it's impossible to please him, God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith is this belief translated into action. And so without obedience, you cannot have this genuine faith. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. He did things, right? Acted. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. And then verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed. So what do you do with that? You know, how do you separate those two? How do you take this scripture and, and, and throw it away because you want to say that, that there is no obedience that must be that must accompany faith? There's no works that must accompany faith. But yet Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. He went out by faith and he obeyed. So back to Galatians 2. So the point should be apparent now and I think you know, obviously we're going through we can't just say oh, okay you know you're justified by faith we cannot just kind of leave it hanging because we have to answer the, you know the, the elephant in the room for everybody else who's going to go by and read this and what they're going to say this means but we have to put it all together and we have to see and we have to understand what each thing is for and how they work together and how God designed this whole system as it were so verse 17, but if while we, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. Okay, of course, justification means to be declared right, to be made right. Justification means to be made righteous in God's sight. Righteousness is being like God and having the same character as God, the perfect, holy and righteous. Now, there's no amount of obedience to laws that can do this. I can say again, that's not going to forgive past sins, is it? It's, it is by asking for forgiveness and having faith in the sacrifice of Christ that it will be granted and our sins will be covered. Let's go ahead and t briefly turn to Romans 6. Six one and two. So Romans six verse one. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? So that grace may be that grace may abound. This grace that this forgiveness of our sins, then may we should we continue in sin that we get more grace? Because that's the object, is grace, right? Well he says certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Once we've made that commitment and we put the carnal man behind and we say we're going to live this other way of life, you can't go back to it. Okay? We continue to live in a godly, righteous way, not in sin. So, so just keep your finger there because we're going to come right back. 
So we're to keep the law that is to quit sinning. It's law and grace. They each have their purpose and their function. Verse 18 of Galatians 2, For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. So if I build again those things which I destroyed. So back to Romans 6, verses 3 through 6. And he continues, what is it that was destroyed? Or do you not know that many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So again, it's not by death that we are saved. It is by his life and his resurrection and faith in that that we walk in newness of life. His resurrection, his rising up out of this grave. Verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, the carnal sinful man, was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, or destroyed. In the King James Version, it has, for done away with, it has destroyed. This, you know, that Galatians 2.18 was saying, was building again the things which were destroyed. This is what was destroyed, right? The old man, why? That we should no longer be slaves of sin. We do not go back to that way of life. He's saying, if you do, then you make yourself a transgressor again. So, back to Galatians. He says, if I build again those things which I destroyed, the old man, the sinful old man, then I become a transgressor, somebody who breaks the law. That is not the purpose. That is not the direction. So even though justification comes by faith, he continues to say that we are to keep the law, not go back to our old ways. For I, verse 19, through the law died to the law that I might live to God. It was through his, <clears throat> his understanding of the law that we know, and this, through our understanding of the law, that we know by breaking it or sinning, in other words, we would die because of it, right? The wages of sin is death. Therefore, the only way to live was to or towards God, having faith in God. Well, the law gives us the knowledge of sin, and when we sin, it brings about death. Right? That's where that's where the law leads. Right? It is this faith in Christ that's coming up out of the grave, the leaving the other behind, that gives us the life. Romans seven verses nine through twelve. It says, I was once I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. He only thought he was alive. He only thought he wasn't sinning, but there was always a law, a law that was going. He didn't know about it at the time. He didn't realize the rules. But then when he found out that there was a necessity to keep the commandments, as well as how he was supposed to keep them, he then understood that sin was breaking the law and it carried the penalty of death with it. And then the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. So the law is to show us the character and the nature of God, the way that we are to live, and how God wants us to live. That, that way that leads to being like them and eventually you know, will lead to being with them. Well, how did it bring death? Well, when you break it, then that's when it comes, Romans 6.23. Now, verse 11, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and it killed me. So, of course, he's speaking metaphorically because this was not the intent of the law to deceive him. But because of our lack of understanding, it is indeed what happens. But we know that we are not tempted or that God does not tempt us. He does not try to draw us away. It's for our own desires and enticement and lust that that happens. Then verse 12, therefore, meaning based on what he previously said, here's the conclusion he comes to. The law is holy and the commandment holy and just 
and good. Okay, I don't know that we can say it any plainer that the law and commandments of God are this way. They are they are righteousness. So back to Galatians. <clears throat> the, the law reveals sin and it condemns us because we don't fulfill its requirements. It makes us a sinner and then it punishes us for it as it were. But now we have Jesus Christ. All right. So again, at the time, here's Galatians, and he's saying, okay, we have the law, but this is what the law does. This is what any of this knowledge does. Any of these works of law, this is what it leads to. But it is faith in Jesus Christ that justifies us. Verse 20, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lived, but Christ lives in me. This is the means by which we are able to know what the law is, right and wrong, and to do it. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't set aside grace. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, if justification being made righteous comes through the law then Christ died in vain why did we need Christ why did we need him to come and to live the life that he did God being the son of God who he was and to live a perfect life and to accomplish all that he accomplished why did we need any of that if all this stuff could be accomplished through the law well it couldn't because the law does not bring about justification but justification does not do away with the law either.